Hello everyone, I am The Enforcer, and welcome to The Breaking News. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and support us on Patreon, link in the description below. Starting off with our first breaking news of the day, the Russian government has announced an emergency meeting with the central bank to try and find a way to uh, fix the major financial troubles that the Russian government has been having over the past few months, mostly year and a half. Russian financial troubles have been plaguing the nation since the beginning of the war with Ukraine on February 23rd of 2022, and just recently, for the first time in Russian history, the ruble broke the value of 100 rubles per US dollar, a first in history, and showing the massive economic strain that has been created on the Russian Federation due to crippling sanctions and economic stagnation. Due to this, a decision came after an emergency meeting held today that they will be hiking up interest rates massively in the Russian Federation to try and deal with the inflation and to try and keep it at a stable level, not trying to completely negate the amount uh, that the ruble has, has devalued recently. This also appears to once again be more fuel to the fire that Russian economic uh, situations inside of the country are quickly deteriorating. While we don't get to see a lot about it in the public and the Russians do put on a pretty good face propaganda-wise, these kinds of actions and these kinds of emergency steps made to ensure that inflation doesn't continue to skyrocket and the Russian economy doesn't continue to go into a free fall for the next uh, few months clearly shows that the Russians are having major financial troubles. There have also been statements that Russian state-operated companies, largely involved in heavy industry, have not been able to pay their workers, and due to that, we have seen some of these factories close completely or their workers go on violent strikes. We've also seen this extend into the Russian army as well, with a large amount of the Russian army either mutinying at some point, one time or another, due to the lack of pay. This is all showing that the Russians are running low on funds and trying to find any way to scrape the barrel to either keep the money they have and avoid losing it through massive amounts of inflation or to try and avoid paying people so that way they can save money in one area but spend it in another that may need it. And this is something fairly interesting because while the Russians are having economic hardships and some very tough times, the Russians and the Belarusians are taking a concerted effort to continue to try and escalate with the Western world, specifically the NATO countries on the NATO frontier, the Baltic states and Poland. The Wagner forces are still built up along the Belarusian border from what we understand. We have heard, adding on to the financial difficulties, that the Wagner is not getting paid anymore by the Russian government nor the Belarusians. So nobody really knows how long they will be at the border. But nevertheless, from what we understand, they are still there at the moment. And this is largely considered to be a Russian action. The Polish are alleging that the Wagner is actually a part of the Russian Ministry of Defense now, now that most of those uh, soldiers signed contracts with the Russian MOD. But the Belarusians are also hosting them at the same time and allowing them to build bases and camps, making this a joint Russian and Belarusian venture as they continue to try and escalate tensions with the Western world. The Polish, of course, have not responded to this well and have been building up thousands of soldiers along the border, equipped with some of Poland's most high-tech and advanced equipment to deal with any kind of threat that may come their way. And it appears that the Polish are making a very strong example today, or a very strong posture, as they held the largest military parade to ever occur in their country's history. I'm going to be muting this clip, but here are some slow shots of the Polish military parade from today. And this was the largest by any measure. It had the largest foreign contingency. It had the largest amount of armored vehicles involved. It had the largest amount of soldiers involved in any Polish military parade seen in, up until this point. And it is clearly showing in a sense, in a diplomatic sense, that the Polish are ready to go. They are not going to be playing games whatsoever when it comes to the Russian threat or the threat of further Russian aggression along their border. And the increased size of this parade is meant to spread that image as best as it possibly can. And to fast forward through a little bit of it, is it also shows off some other aspects of the parade. We can see some armored vehicles, police escorts, the whole kit, really. I mean, really anything you can imagine, they had it. They had Abrams tanks and K2 main battle tanks on display at the military parade. It was truly a show of force by the Poles, and showing that it was playing no games whatsoever, and the NATO countries that also have their forces inside of Poland, for example, the U.S. forces we see here on film, are also there to back up their Polish allies in the NATO alliance, and showing a united front against the 
threat of aggression from the Wagner unit, of course, backed by the Russians and supported and fielded inside of Belarus. NATO, however, is still trying to find ways to calm the situation, and the NATO General Secretary, Stoltenberg, has continued to try and come up with ideas and solutions to the crisis that we're seeing at the moment, especially in between the Western world and Russia. And we have seen that Stoltenberg has come out with a statement today that was fairly interesting. Before I even read off this statement, I have to say that I would not get too violent about this statement. Some people have been trying to take this out of context. Stoltenberg made this statement today and immediately went after the statement and said that this is only an option and most likely an unlikely one, but it's just an idea out there in the playing field. So don't take this as the official NATO stance, considering that it's coming from the Secretary General. This is only an idea of all of the options that the Ukrainians or the Western world could have to try and bring a resolution to this war and get a mostly positive outcome out of it. General, Se uh, General Secretary Stoltenberg stated today that it is possible for Ukraine to give up territory to the Russians in exchange for NATO membership. Now, of course, I have to say that this was a theory. This is not what NATO is going to be going off of. This is only something that was suggested, again, by Stoltenberg. The reason why this is being suggested is because, from what we understand... NATO countries cannot join while they are actively in a war. While it doesn't really say that anywhere in the NATO Charter, that is the going rule that NATO works off of in the applications process. If the Ukrainians were to give concessions to the Russians, as in giving them Crimea and maybe the Donbass, it is supposed that the war would end and then the remainder of Ukraine, that would still be under con sovereign control by the state of Ukraine, could then go into the ascension process to join NATO and then join it. This is a bit of a, of a win-loss. While Ukraine would be in NATO, the loss would be is that they have not reclaimed Crimea or kicked the Russian Black Sea Fleet out of Crimea. Uh, and also the Russians will still hold the Donbass, which is resource-rich and some of the raw materials needed for economic growth, such as natural gas, steel, etc. The Russians would still control all of those things. And that is what creates a win-loss situation out of this. While we are achieving getting Ukraine into NATO, we are not achieving the strategic aim of removing the Russian Black Sea Fleet from being able to operate in the Middle Eastern theater at all times of the year, which is a bit of a big issue. However, this is just an option, but the Ukrainians have already made a rebuttal to this option, saying that leasing Crimea or giving Crimea to Russia will never be an option. This statement came today from a Ukrainian official, according to the caption here, uh, uh, Oleski Danilov was the one to make this statement today. He said that this is not an option, and this is something that you're going to see reflected heavily in the rest of the Ukrainian government. Of course, Zelensky has not made an official comment on the statement by the Secretary General today, but that is inconsequential. We know the stance of the Ukrainian government, and we know why they want the territory back. It is their sovereign territory since 1991, when they became an independent country. And not only that, seeing to it that Ukraine reclaims Crimea and the Donbass, will ensure several things, but most importantly, the most important aspect that it would secure is that the Russian Black Sea Fleet would no longer be in Sevastopol. It would have to be somewhere else. Either it would have to go to Novorossiysk, meaning that they would have to greatly reduce the size of the fleet, so that way the port facilities in Novorossiysk could actually take care of the fleet. Otherwise, it would be too big. Novorossiysk just doesn't have the ability to take care of the Black Sea Fleet at the size it is right now. That fleet would have to be far smaller, Therefore, there would be less power projection and it would pose less of a risk to Western countries in the area, for example, in the Middle East or in the Black Sea. Or, the Black Sea fleet would completely cease to exist. Novorossiysk might not be able to support really any Russian ships rather than a small flotilla of destroyers and corvettes. And at that point, it isn't really even officially a fleet. It is a flotilla. And so most of the Navy may have to be transferred over to the Pacific Fleet in Vladivostok or the Baltic Fleet up in St. Petersburg or even the, uh, the Arctic Fleet way up there at Murmansk or Arkhangelsk. And based off of this, this is really the major implication. And I've explained this several times before, but to give it the rundown, for the United States to be able to control the Middle East and kind of put the boot to the Chinese and the Russians as far as making economic growth a little bit more difficult and more costly, we kind of have to control the large amount of oil production in the world that is exported, and that comes from the Middle East. And so by being able to control that uncontested, 
we, one, stop the Belt and Road program that the Chinese are attempting to bring into the Middle East, and two, we can also buy that oil from these Middle Eastern countries like Saudi Arabia, Iraq, etc., and this will cut the Chinese out of being a possible buyer for these imports, which will make it more expensive for them to be able to run their economy because there will be less oil available, and therefore their economic system will have to run on less, therefore costing them more, and the economic growth will not happen as rapidly. It will slow them down. This is also the same for the Russians, because while the Russians aren't necessarily getting any benefit like the Chinese are out of the Middle East, the Russians and the Chinese kind of operate in tandem at this point in time, and so the Russians would be using their Black Seed to secure advantages for the Chinese, and in exchange, the Chinese would, of course, help to support the Russians economically and financially. So going off of all this, it is very important for the Russian Black Sea Fleet to be kicked out. And so the Ukrainian stance, as far as Western strategic concerns, is a pretty good one. And we need to support them in ensuring that they retake Crimea and the Donbass. However, while interesting news has been coming out today, there was a one bit of unfortunate news that occurred over last night. Sadly, three missiles from the Russian government, uh, of course fired off from Russian territory, hit a major military factory in the city of Dnipro. From what we understand, three missiles struck it and have caused serious damage, knocking the factory out. This factory produced unguided rockets and missiles. That was the first missile impacting the factory. We now hear the second missile flying in. And we can see it hitting another part of the facility. We now hear the third missile coming in. This one hitting in the center of the facility. Unlike most Russian attacks, this one actually had a strategic aim with the missile attack. Unfortunately, air, Ukrainian air defense inside the city of Dnipro appears to have been completely inadequate for this attack and may have been overwhelmed. The fourth missile also hit outside the perimeter of the factory, causing superficial damage. But nevertheless, the damage to the factory is somewhat serious, of course, considering that it is producing war materials such as unguided rockets and also guided missiles. This could greatly set back the Ukrainians' ability to strike deep behind Russian lines with their own homemade weapons, and that also means that it's completely limiting their ability for deep strikes, for example, on the Kerch Bridge or into Crimea. Considering that only Ukrainian weapons can be used to attack the Kerch Bridge, there has been agreements made with Western countries for their long-range weapons that they could not be used to attack the Kerch Bridge or inside of Russia, this means that their ability to attack in the future on the Kerch Bridge in Russia may be reduced due to the lack of new missiles and rockets being produced by the factory in Dnipro. It's not the only one, there are other factories that produce this equipment, but the Ukrainian supply consumption is massive. It is uh, it is insatiable, really, and so it requires all of these factories to be operating at full speed all times of the year. And of course, with one being knocked out right now, and probably not going to be back online in months, this could start to pose a serious issue. However, while that may be posing a serious issue, the frontline situation is good, especially in the area of Robotne. A drone from the Ukrainian side was actually able to spot Tokmak in the distance today from where the Ukrainian front lines are. This drone is flying about two to 3,000 feet up from what we can tell and looking into the distance to the southwest from the Ukrainian frontline positions. And we can see Tokmak right there in the picture out in the distance. And that is a good thing. That means they're getting close. Because if they take Tokmak, they are going to be in direct striking distance of Melitopol, down the major highway. And from what we can tell, there really isn't any good defensive positions the Russians could take up on the major highway leading to Melitopol, unless if they were to try and set up defenses along this village chain or the small country road here on the other side of this river and attempt to overlook it. But of course, the geography, while showing on, while not really being shown on the map, could make that impossible, and the Ukrainians could have a complete advantage once they take the town of Tokmak, and it could be a pretty easy battle to make it all the way down the highway and to Melitopol, splitting the Russian lines in two. But nevertheless, that is all of the major news that we have had today. 
I thank everyone so much once again for watching. If y'all did enjoy, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe as we put videos out like these almost every single day of the week. We also run nightly war summaries, well, war live streams, six days a week at 10 p.m. Eastern Time every single night, except for Mondays. And so with that, thank you all so much once again for watching, and I will see you all in the next one.